Hi, my name is John Andelin. I'm creating a series of videos that expose the theory of evolution as a baseless, outdated idea that can't be supported by objective science. Now, the topic for today is the fossil record and how it applies to evolution. Now, the fossil record is often used as if it's evidence for evolution, when in fact, the fossil record has never supported the idea of evolution. The only reason it's used is because all the other arguments for evolution have failed. Now, I'm going to point out five serious problems in using the fossil record as evidence for evolution. Interpretation is selective. It's subjective. It's reliant entirely on homology, and this is a failed argument. And generally, the morphologic variability of species, which is profound, this is generally ignored. And there is no accurate method of dating a fossil. Now, for the first point, the interpretation of the fossil record is made by cherry picking data. And this is because the interpretation of fossils is used not to arrive at the truth, but to justify a worldview. And this is why I refer to the propagation of evolution as a mask of science. This is not science. This is a facade. This is a principle I learned very early in my medical training, that science is based on looking at all the data and then weighing the evidence. You can't just look at anecdotes and justify a pre-drawn conclusion. That's what quacks do. For example, if it's claimed that an herbal medicine can cure cancer, then a study needs to be conducted that documents that all bias has been eliminated. If someone reports only successes, his research will not be considered for publication. When the fossil record is used to justify evolution, invariably selective evidence is given. If someone finds a fossil that appears transitional, he thinks he's validated evolution. And this will readily be accepted for publication in mainstream biology journals. This isn't the way legitimate scientific investigation is conducted. Stephen Jay Gould, who is perhaps the most respected paleontologist of the 20th century, made this statement. Stasis, or non-change of most fossil species during their lengthy geologic time spans, was tacitly acknowledged by all paleontologists, but almost never studied explicitly because prevailing theory treated stasis as uninteresting, non-evidence for evolution. The overwhelming prevalence of stasis became an embarrassing feature of the fossil record, best left ignored as a manifestation of nothing, that is, non-evolution. And then later he stated, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. So you see, Gould is admitting that paleontologists routinely cherry-pick data. They are interested in missing links and set out to find them, not to determine whether or not the fossil record really supports evolution. Now, not only is this not legitimate science, this is what we call fraud or quackery in the world of medicine. This approach utterly disqualifies evolution as science from a perspective of paleontology. The selective interpretation of data is a critical flaw in scientific thinking. Like people who peddle snake oil, the fossil record is based on anecdotes. In order to make a correct interpretation of the fossil record, you need to look at the overall pattern. And that pattern is, as Stephen Jay Gould stated, the abrupt appearance of species in the fossil record followed by stasis and then extinction with no gradualistic change. Now you might often hear that the reason for the lack of transitional fossils is because fossils are rare. Fossils are not rare. Over 100 million fossils have been discovered, and 250,000 species are represented, spanning a supposed time period of 500 million years. Now, evolutionists often treat the fossil record as if it's just icing on the cake. And some even go far as to say that even if we couldn't find any transitional fossils, evolution is still secure. Listen to this. But even if we had zero hominid fossils, we would know that we're closer related to chimps and gorillas than the rest of the apes. Because every single cell in your body is proof of that. Okay? When you take a DNA from your hair or your fingernails or any tissue like you see on CSI where they swab the cheeks, they can immediately sequence your DNA. Now this is a common talking point. It's believed that humans and apes are related because of DNA, 
regardless of what the fossils say. This is a gross error of scientific logic. Evolution predicts millions of intermediate fossils, and if that pattern isn't there, evolution never happened. Science is not based on anecdotes, but on patterns of observation. Now, some people are going to tell you that there are numerous transitional species in the fossil record. And I've even heard the statement that every species is transitional. Don't fall for this. Expected intermediate forms are missing by the millions. For example, if you look at the fossil record of all four lineages that supposedly develop powered flight, birds, reptiles, insects, and mammals, no intermediate species that are imperfect in their ability to fly have been identified. In the case of flying reptiles, over a thousand fossilized specimens have been found, spanning a supposed evolutionary time period of over 130 million years, and they are all equally perfected in their ability to fly. Now, this pattern is real and is not squarely addressed, and the same is true for bats. Thousands of fossilized specimens have been identified on multiple continents, spanning a supposed evolutionary time period of over 50 million years, and they are all equally perfected in their ability to fly. And furthermore, analysis of skulls have convinced most paleontologists that they were equally as capable of echolocation as modern bats. Now, point number two, the interpretation of fossils is subjective. In other words, conclusions are subject to bias. Take a look at this, the supposed origin of Homo erectus, a pre-human ancestor based on fossils uncovered in Indonesia in 1894 by Eugene Dubois. He went on an expedition with the goal of finding a human missing link. So there was bias from the beginning. And then he found a skull cap, which appeared very ape-like. And then he found a human femur 46 feet away the following year. And he also found a tooth. He assumed that these all pertain to the same being. So the femur appeared human, and that indicated an upright posture. And the skull cap indicated lower intelligence, hence an ape that walked upright. And from these assumptions, a reconstructed pre-human ancestor was extrapolated. And by the way, he found several fully human skulls nearby, but he didn't report this finding for over 25 years because he knew that this would cast doubt upon what he'd found as a supposed pre-human species. Now, this is not science. This is imaginative storytelling based on wishful thinking. What you have is a pre-drawn conclusion that man evolved from apes, and now you're trying to make data look like it fits your paradigm. Now, the next problem with the fossil record is the unwarranted assumption that homology proves relatedness. Now, homology refers to similarities between species. For example, the overall shape of a human head and a chimpanzee are homologous. The problem with this is that there are many, many examples in nature of homologous features in isolated species that no one believes are related by common descent. An example of this is the eye of a squid in the eye of a human. They're nearly identical, yet this can't be attributed to a common ancestor that had a complex eye. These sophisticated organs supposedly evolved independent from one another. Now, if you examine the seminal evidence of whale evolution, one of the key findings that's always brought up is the homology of middle ear anatomy of modern cetaceans, and how this is similar to the anatomy of a supposed whale ancestor Pachycetus. Thus, Pachycetus is obviously an ancestor to whale based on middle ear anatomy. Now, this ignores the ubiquitous presence of convergence in nature involving multiple systems. So, we found an ancestor to whales, Pachycetus. And what's the primary evidence? The middle ear anatomy, which could easily be explained by convergence. So, what I'm saying is you can't establish a line of descent just by looking at homology. Now, the fourth point, morphologic variability of species. This is something that's rarely considered in the interpretation of the fossil record. The morphologic variability of species is dramatically demonstrated in the selective breeding of dogs. 
Every canine species today is descended from the common gray wolf, and all dogs can interbreed with each other and with the gray wolf, so they're all one species. Yet look at the differences in anatomy, particularly skull morphology. Now, all dogs are 99.9% .9 identical in terms of their DNA. So this teaches us an important principle of biology. You cannot look at phenotype and accurately judge the degree of genetic differences or similarities. Here are four different dog skulls, Chihuahua, Bulldog, St. Bernard, and Greyhound. This demonstrates the difference that can occur within one species. Now look at these two skulls, a fox and a Tasmanian wolf. Very similar in appearance, yet separate species. The Tasmanian wolf is a marsupial. Here's another example, a white bull terrier and a mountain lion skull. These are similar in form, but they are very different species. I also need to point out that the greatest variability within a species includes skull shape and overall stature, such as size and strength of the limbs. Other features, such as the microscopic structure of feathers or the overall body plan and design, these are fixed traits. Notice that in all supposed pre-human ancestors, the only traits that are considered are those that are known to vary, such as the skull shape. You'll never see variations of foot morphology that demonstrate transition from an ape foot, which has an opposable big toe, to a human foot. So what they do is make false extrapolations. They take traits that are known to vary, such as head shape, and extend these observations to fixed traits that never vary, such as the transition of an ape foot to a human foot. Now, the reason I'm bringing up morphologic variability is because this plasticity of species can account for nearly all of the alleged transitional species that are found. If you examine all proposed candidates for human evolution, Essentially, all the evidence they give is skull shape, and every candidate can be attributed to either an ape or a human that has undergone inbreeding. So when you factor in the degree of morphologic variability inherent in every species, there is no convincing evidence that there has been any fundamental change in a species over time. Now, a final flaw in the fossil record that I need to point out is the fact that there is no accurate way of dating a fossil. When someone states that a pre-human fossil is one and a half million years old, understand that this is scientifically baseless. There are no standards used as absolute reference points and none of the data is reproducible. It's founded on selective interpretation of data. Only dates that fit with evolutionary assumptions are used. This is another manifestation of scientific fraud. And this is a subject that I'll be exploring in a future video. The fallacy of radiometric dating is as it applies to the fossil record. If you examine any proposed line of descent based on fossils, it is readily apparent that everything is based on wishful thinking. Now, as I mentioned, the most frequently cited evidence of whale evolution is the middle ear anatomy of the supposed ancestors of modern cetaceans. With that assumption, based on incomplete fossilized skeletons, it's imagined that Ambulocetus had hind legs that were gradually stretched backward with webbed feet. Then Rhodocetus had even more underdeveloped hindquarters, despite no evidence of this in the fossil record. And notice how perfected tail flukes suddenly sprung out of nowhere. These are imaginary reconstructions that are not founded on scientific observation. Over the past several decades, the fossil record has become increasingly used as evidence for evolution. This is being increasingly emphasized because all other evidence for evolution has been decisively refuted. Thank you for your interest in these videos. I hope you'll subscribe to my channel and please feel free to contact me if you have any suggestions for future topics.